All right, <clears throat> so we've been studying the book of 2 Timothy, and 2 Timothy is an epistle, that means it's one of the New Testament letters, which we read the introduction for last week, and now we're moving into the book a little further. And it's written by Paul, is our author, who wrote many of the books in the New Testament, and he's writing to Timothy. Paul is located in Rome currently, and that is not for a good reason. That's because he is imprisoned uh, for the second time at least. And here's the thing that you've got to understand about Paul's situation is that it is bad. Paul leaves little doubt as you read through this book that he is not going to escape this situation, that this indeed will be the end of the road for Paul. He almost certainly would be killed. You know, he's he's, he's chained up. He is, uh, you know, awaiting his fate, and it's almost certainly going to be his demise. And so he writes then to Timothy. This is the last letter that we have from Paul. And so it's completely loaded with meaning and sometimes with emotion because he's writing to Timothy, who was like his closest friend, Probably by this point in his life, certainly one of his closest colleagues, Timothy, a guy that Paul had brought along with him and mentored. And now Timothy has been sent to Ephesus, where he is overseeing the church movement happening there. He's sort of been dispatched to hold down the fort in Ephesus. And Paul is writing him, and now Timothy is learning that he's going to have to carry on the work without Paul. And so after a pretty emotional introduction at the beginning, this is the challenge, or I guess the encouragement, that Paul gave Timothy last week, we read in verse 6. He said, For this reason, I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. He was like, Timothy, you've got you've to rekindle your fire. You've got to fan into flames your coals. You've got to stoke up what God has given you in in your calling and your spiritual gifts and the spirit who lives within you. You're going to have to gather up what you have for the challenges ahead. And so I've been saying, I I feel like this book is just exactly right for right now in life because it has, like we said last week, it's got this gritty determination to it. Let's keep reading. Here's our, here's the verse we're going to camp out on today. Verse 8, therefore, he says, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. Do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. A very strong command. And it's, it's in the form of kind of your classic thesis antithesis. You know, if you notice, he says, he says a thing, and then he says, do this thing and don't do the opposite of this thing. That's a strong way to make an argument. Join with me in suffering and do not be ashamed. And so here's our, here's our main point. Join with me in suffering. Another home run main point for you guys uh, been trying to have the most discouraging main points possible. <laughs> Join with me in suffering. You're sitting there and you're like, dude, I'm suffering already. I drove here in the rain. I'm wearing a mask. I'm cordoned off in an area of the room like a kid at the reject table at lunch. And I, I come out here and you're like, Join with me in suffering. It's very Paul. Um, the Bible says a lot of things about suffering. And it has a lot of encouragements like this to bear up under suffering. But I think that Paul has something very specific in mind. I think he's actually zeroed in on a specific aspect of suffering. And I'm getting that from, in part, the word. It's a very unusual word that he's using. This might be the only place, maybe one other place in the New Testament where it appears. And it's basically, the the root word is is about um, enduring mistreatment by other people being mistreated by others, and then the prefix is to accompany me. So it's a word that literally means accompany me in my mistreatment. Come along with me as I'm mistreated by others. And I also think the point is sharpened 
you know, there's lots of general kinds of suffering we can go to, but I think, I think this point is really sharpened by the antithesis. You know, if I say, join me in suffering, but then I say what the opposite of that would be, it sharpens what he's trying to get at. And the opposite of what he's saying would be to be ashamed. And so what he's saying here is, accompany me in my mistreatment rather than retreating in shame. Join me as I endure shame. That's what he's saying. Do not be ashamed. You know, shame, shame is a really interesting topic. Shame is very powerful. I think it's got to be one of the most powerful emotions that we can feel. What changes people's behavior faster than shame? You know? You know this if you're a parent. It's tempting to use shame because it's so effective, but you shouldn't. <laughs> And this type of shame here, you know, there's shame when we, do, when we do something bad and we know it. But here I think he's talking about that special kind of shame, which is where you're standing out, where you're, you're associated with something that has fallen out of favor, and all of a sudden the spotlight is on you about that. Have you ever experienced that feeling before? I remember the first time I experienced this kind of shame. It was in sixth grade. So in sixth grade, there was this album that came out. An album dropped that was an earth shattering, it changed everything. I'm sure you know what album I'm talking about. I'm talking about Vanilla Ice to the Extreme, okay? Very important album in music history. No, not really, but it was a big deal at my school. Every single kid knew it. Every kid knew every lyric to Ice Ice Baby, especially the cool kids. And I felt behind the curve because I didn't know the lyrics. And so I was like, oh man, I'm not in with the cool kids. And I remember sitting in my room listening to WNCI, hoping that it would come on so that I could try to write down the lyrics as fast as I could. It was desperate. And then uh, several months later, my dreams came true when for Christmas, I received this cassette tape as a Christmas gift. And you know what it had in the cassette tape was the lyrics. And so that Christmas break, I, I'm not making this up. I literally studied, I crammed the lyrics night and day until I knew them totally cold. I almost said until I knew them ice cold. Oh, I should have said that. Till I knew them ice cold. <laughs> and... Uh, and then I went to school, chin held high. I brought the cassette with me to school. Here's the thing. Somehow, something mysterious had happened, which is that the favor had turned about Vanilla Ice. And I remember sitting down at the lunch table and to my horror, discovering that now, now the prevailing wisdom was not only that Vanilla Ice was not cool, but that he was the opposite of cool. And who could lie? He's the worst. And there I was with my Vanilla Ice cassette tape. And I vividly remember a kid getting in my face and being like, you like that? Do you like that? And everyone laughing. And this sense of shame welling up. And I was like, no. You know, no, I don't like that. I wish I could tell you I had more of a spine than that. that I, I wish I could tell you that I was like, you guys liked it yesterday. You know, I should have said, all right, stop. <laughs> but I didn't. Instead, I just gave in. But it was too late, you know, they knew. The pack of animals had turned on the weakest animal, and it was me. Chad kicked me in the butt at recess that day, and no one did anything about it, you know. I was on the outs. That's the world for you. And that's, and that's, shame can sneak up on you like that. And I also think that in our culture, I've noticed that I think that we we're kind of falling in love with shame as a go-to. Our, our culture is kind of into shame. I think it's because it's so effective and because the internet is such a great platform for shame. There's a debate in my neighborhood right now or over the last couple years about where you should rake your leaves. Should you rake them into the gutter where the thing can come by and suck them up? Or do you rake them onto the sidewalk, which is right by the gutter, so the thing can suck them up? And there's two factions. And you might be surprised to hear about this, but uh, Facebook has not reached a consensus on, <laughs> on what to do. They didn't, it didn't result in harmony. And it wasn't long until people turned to shame. And so people started posting pictures of people's leaf piles and being like, look at these leaves in the gutter. Guess you don't care about the creek wildlife. And then someone else being like, look at these leaves 
on the sidewalk. Someone could fall down in front of your house and then you'd have blood on your hands. And I'm like, geez, that's powerful because then what happens is when you go out to rake, you know, you're going out there and you're like, you know, like, is anybody videotaping this? I'm raking them right up to the very edge. So maybe I have plausible deniability that it could, maybe they just fell into the gutter. I don't know. I don't want to choose a side. What is that? That's shame. And shame is super effective. Why would Timothy be tempted to retreat in shame? That's a good question, right? He's saying, don't be ashamed. What would Timothy have to be ashamed about? Well, he says right here, don't be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. Your testimony, or the, the te- that, that word there is like to testify in court, to bear witness. It just means to tell the truth about what you have seen. And so he's saying here, don't be ashamed of the truth about Christ, which one could feel shame in being honest about the truth about Christ. You know, Jesus Christ was the Messiah, and yet, you know, to, to the testimony of our Lord is that our Messiah was a nobody. He wasn't a king or a noble. Our Messiah was crucified on a cross, which is totally shameful. That's like the most shameful way. It was designed to literally shame you to death. Say, I follow a guy who was crucified, and then to say, I follow a guy who was, in fact, resurrected from the dead. What a preposterous idea. You could understand why someone might incur shame getting on board with that. And he also says, don't be ashamed of me, his prisoner. Paul was locked up. Paul was facing death. That's tremendously shameful. That's a disgrace. Paul used to be somebody important. Remember that? Paul was a big deal. Look at him now. He's a nobody. He's locked up in chains. He's going to die in shame. And actually, if you read in verse 15, listen to what Paul says here. He says, you're aware of the fact that all who are in Asia turned away from me, among whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. People were deserting Paul because Paul had become radioactive. People are distancing themselves from Paul because he's a goner. And he's saying, don't be ashamed of the truth about Christ. Don't be ashamed about me and don't be ashamed of the gospel, the message of Christ, which is that all can come and be rescued by him, that all can be reconciled to God through what he did on the cross in taking our place. You know, that message is offensive all on its own that you fall short of God's standard, that you have sin that needs covered by Christ, and he did that as an act of mercy and grace, that's offensive too. There's plenty for Timothy to feel that way about. Here's 1 Corinthians 1, 23. We preach Christ crucified to Jews, a stumbling block, and to Gentiles, foolishness. He's acknowledging the shame that you could incur by aligning yourself with what the Bible says. And these are all reasons and more that Timothy might have for wanting to shrink back. We've said nothing about the challenges he faces in Ephesus alone. How about for you? Do you resonate with this at all? I'm reading this and I'm like, man, uh, I get this. The gospel has not gotten any less shocking or offensive over the last 2,000 years. Not one bit. It is just as shocking and offensive. The idea of resurrection is just as preposterous now as it was then. And I think we sense it maybe more acutely in our culture as our culture is changing. You know, our culture is increasingly more secular and less Christian. Our culture is increasingly more, some people call it a post-Christian culture. And I think that you can sense this. I notice just anecdotally, people respond differently lead in my faith than they did 20 years ago. I remember when I came to Christ and I told my friends, I decided to follow Christ. I'm going to turn my life around and I'm going to live for others as more important to myself. Even my friends who wanted nothing to do with God, their reaction was generally positive. It was generally like, well, good for you. You know, that's a good thing. I don't get that vibe anymore like I used to. I think there is a change here and I think there's more at stake for people who want to put their chips down on Jesus Christ and his testimony 
This passage, I think, becomes increasingly relevant. You might be more and more tempted to retreat in shame or just to shut up, to avoid incurring shame. But Paul says, do not be ashamed. That's the point. Don't be ashamed and instead join with me in suffering. He is challenging Timothy to move willingly into this kind of suffering. Don't shrink back from shame, but stand with me. Move forward willingly into what others will find shameful. That's, that's Paul's message here. <laughs> it's a tall order. You know, that's, that's a pretty hard ask. Come join me in my shame. You know, I read this and my, my first reaction is like, why? Why would I want to do that? Why would I take that up? And luckily, Paul gives us, he gives Timothy some supporting rationale. So as we look a little deeper in this passage, we're going to see that he says, join with me in suffering. Why? Because of what we're suffering for. Join with me in suffering because of who we suffer with. And join with me in suffering because of the power with which we face it. So let's look at those three. What we suffer for, who we suffer with, and the power with which we face it. First of all, what we suffer for. Let me ask you, what would be worth incurring shame? What would it take for you to willingly be ashamed? You know, some things would be worth it. If it was urgent, if it was important, if it was something that really mattered, then it would be worth it. Vanilla ice is not worth it. You know, like, I, I'm not willing to incur shame. Like, ask me, Ben, do you still like Vanilla Ice? Do you still know all the lyrics to Ice Ice Baby? And you know what? I'm not going to say because it's not worth the shame, right? I will throw him under the bus like that. Some things aren't worth enduring shame. Some things are. And what he says here is the testimony and the gospel are. Did you guys see that movie, um, 1917? I won't spoil it if you didn't see it. But in the premise that they set up right away in that movie is that two soldiers in World War I are tasked with a mission where they're supposed to take a message to a general on the other side of the battlefield, on the other side of no man's land. And the problem is that, that commander or whoever, that officer is leading a charge of uh, over a thousand men who believe they are going to be victorious, and what they don't know is they're charging into a trap, and they're almost all certainly going to die. And the main character, his brother, is among them. And so they've got 48 hours to get this desperate message to them to call off the attack. And what's great about this movie, then, is that as they, they move forward through all of these trials and hurdles, the whole time they're suffering, obviously, but also they're incurring uh, shame, because the message that they carry, first of all, nobody wants to believe it. Nobody does believe it. And nobody wants to hear it, including the people who outrank them. And so it's this constant uphill battle to deliver this message. And yet what you see is time and time again, they disregard the shame. They don't care about that, the shame and the suffering, because the value of saving the lives so far outweighs however people treat them. And there's this great climactic scene where... Here's one of the main characters running perpendicular across everyone else. It's almost symbolic. Everyone's going this way, and he's running the opposite way. And everyone's running into him and looking at him like, you idiot, you fool. And they have no idea he's doing it to save their lives. Paul says, it is worth joining me in suffering because of the testimony of our Lord, the truth about Christ is worth suffering for. It is worth incurring shame for. Why? Because, guys, if there, is, if there is a God and he sent his son to put on flesh, to rescue us, to die in our place on the cross, that would be the most important thing that ever happened. If indeed a man rose from the dead as a symbol, as a as a demonstration of God's power and the salvation available to us, that, that would be something that everyone would need to hear about. If, if indeed God himself had sent them on this mission to bring this message to the world, that would be the most important message that there ever was. 
The gospel is worth it. That word is the good news. It's the announcement that God has intervened into human history, that he's created a way for you to be rescued, that because of Jesus Christ, the path is open, that you can come into a right relationship with him, and he has already paid the way. And all that's left to you is to turn to him in faith and say, I want your death to pay for my sin. I want to be your son or daughter. And I want to do it based on your grace, not my goodness. And that is the offer to every single person. That's the offer that stands here today to you, which is pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing that this movement didn't die here with Paul and it doesn't die with Timothy. Here it is 2,000 years later and this offer, the gospel, stands. That's what we suffer for. We suffer for the gospel. He's saying, join me as a shameless messenger of the news that saves. Romans 1, 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. I don't care how embarrassing it is. I don't care how distasteful it is. I don't care how out of fashion it is. It saves And so it's worth it. We just read this verse, 1 Corinthians 1, 23. But we preach Christ crucified to Jews a stumbling block, to Gentiles foolishness. Here's the rest of that verse. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. It's the one thing worth suffering for. And then, as we read on in our passage, he basically lays out the gospel and his testimony about Jesus. Let's read it. He says, God, in verse 8, who saved us, it's the message that saves, and called us with a holy calling that Paul had been called to a mission by God to, to, to tell the world the gospel, and that this holy calling, that's he's called us to a distinct life to stand out, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose, and grace. It wasn't my good deeds or my, uh, you know, merit that caused him to save me or employ me in his work. It's simply his grace that he rescues us and that he puts us to work in his kingdom, which he says was granted to us in Christ Jesus from all eternity, but has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ. God isn't making this plan up as he goes. He's had this plan laid out from all eternity and it is being progressively revealed to us step by step. Christ who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. You might be embarrassed to tell your friends, I believe Jesus Christ rose from the dead. You might be embarrassed to tell them that. But if that is true, then that means death has been overcome. That is the, our hope that we will live on past our bodily life, that we will live on in eternity forever. And he's like, how could I be, how could I be ashamed of that? That light of hope in the dark. That's the gospel for which he says, I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher. That, that's, that's what I'm doing with my life. I'm proclaiming the gospel. And for this reason... I also suffer these things. Why is Paul in jail for the gospel? But I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to protect what I have entrusted to him until that day. I am not ashamed because I know whom I have believed. And really, the subject is changing now from what we suffer for to who we suffer with. Paul's saying, I've met the risen Christ. Accompany me in suffering, Timothy, because I am accompanying Christ. It's actually kind of remarkable how Paul's life begins to parallel Jesus' life at the end, doesn't it? In chains, falsely accused, deserted by all of his supporters, Suffering humil humiliation and shame and yet standing for the message of truth. He's like, I'm following Christ and, and therefore follow me as I do that. 
When you align your life with Christ, you align with him against the grain. Jesus was an against the grain character. Jesus was an intervention. You know, here's humanity hurtling toward judgment and disaster and alienation from God. And Jesus is this intervention who strikes in, a, you know, coming at a 45 degree angle across every, every, all of the ways that we think to rescue and save. And when we get on board with what he is doing, then we are going to stand out from what the world is doing because the world is wayward. The world is moving away from God and Jesus is moving toward God. So therefore, if you sign on with Jesus, you can expect rejection and indeed shame. There is a decision here about, am I willing to choose into suffering and shame for the sake of what is more important. Hebrews 12, too, this is about Jesus. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. And now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Jesus, Jesus Christ endured shame, but it says he disregarded it. It's like he, he factored in the shame and he made his decision and factored it out because it's nothing compared to the eternal glory in heaven. He says, I am convinced that he is able to protect what I have entrusted to him that day. Paul knew that the gospel had been entrusted to him. He knew what he had been entrusted with and he had in return entrusted his entire life and ministry right back to God because he knows that God is able to protect him, and he knew that, he, that, that what he had entrusted God was not something for this life, but for Christ's return. Paul had the eternal perspective here. Well, there's one more. Uh, we've talked about what we suffer for and who we suffer with. There's one more detail in this passage that we've got to acknowledge, which is right here at the end, he says, uh, so we're back to our kind of home base verse here. Verse 8, therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. He's, I think, referring here back to the previous verse. Actually, our verse starts with the word therefore. This whole argument is predicated on what he just said in verse 7 about the power of God, where he said, for God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. What a great verse. What a great memory verse right there. You want a verse to memorize. When you put your faith in Christ, the Spirit of God comes to live within you. The Spirit himself is alive within us. And he says that Spirit who lives within us, it's, he is not a spirit of timidity. He is not a spirit of fear. Timothy was known for being timid. And I think that, you know, what does it mean to be timid? I think it means to, to clam up. It, it's being afraid of shame. I'm afraid of what others will think of me. And Paul says, yeah, maybe that's true of you, but that is not true of the spirit who lives within you. Timidity and fear make sense in a fallen world because if I'm broken away from God, if it's just me versus reality, then yeah, I should be afraid because I'm vulnerable. And I should be worried about what people think about me and can do to me. But if there is a God who is almighty, powerful, alive within me, then what do I have to fear? If I, if I know that I'm checked off, that, that when I wake up in the morning, I can say, my life is secure with Christ for all eternity, that frees me up to be able to think about other people. He says, the spirit that he's given us isn't timid, but rather a spirit of power. God, who can do anything, who's invited us to get on board with what he, he's like, I want to collaborate with you. I want you to collaborate in with what I'm doing. And when we agree, my, my power will be unleashed when you come in prayer and get on board with what I'm doing. We have power. When we open our mouths in the name of Christ, no matter how timid we feel, we can expect the spirit of power to be involved and the spirit of love. Which, you know, love, that's the opposite of fear. Love is the antidote to fear. 
Because fear is almost always focused on myself. Why are you afraid of something? I'm afraid because of what it means for me or what it will do to me. But love takes my attention and turns it outward to other people. And ironically, fear tends to dissipate when I'm focused on other people. That's a good thing to remember in a year where fear is probably playing an enhanced role in all of our lives. There's more fear going around. And if I wake up every day focused on the threats toward me and what it all means for me, then my fear is going to grow. But if I wake up and entrust my life to God, then I can, and, and focus my attention outward to others, then I can expect my fear to dissipate. He also says we have a spirit of discipline, which sounds kind of like, like he's going to discipline us or self-discipline, but I don't, think that's, I don't think that's the idea. The word here is more about your thinking. It means to recall to one's senses. And actually, everywhere else in the New Testament that this root word is used, it, that's what it's about. Mark 15, remember the, 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 the guy who has the legion of demons, when Jesus cast them out, it says that he's found clothed and in his right mind, the same word. It's translated sound mind, sound judgment, sensible. That's the word that he's using here. We have a spirit who is not afraid, whose fear isn't all warped, or his thinking isn't all warped with fear, but a spirit of power and other-centered love and, and clear thinking, discerning wisdom. That's the spirit who is alive within us. And that is the spirit who wants to animate what you do every day. That's the spirit that you have access to each day, a spirit of bold love and truth. So don't let fear or shame or embarrassment bully you into clamming up about what Jesus Christ has done in your life. I think that summarizes what Paul is saying right here. Yeah, you're gonna feel fear and you're gonna feel shame and embarrassment, but we can choose into that by the power of the Holy Spirit who will sustain us and advance the truth through us despite those things if we're willing to put that toe of faith out there and open our mouths and let him do his thing. So I think that's a great challenge. And I think it's a timely challenge because I think that right now our world is hurting and your friends and neighbors and family members, they are hurting. We are all hurting. And the, and the darkness of the world is more gloomy and dark than ever. And so a very small word of hope in Jesus Christ shines very brightly. And so I think we should take up Paul's challenge. Let's not shrink back in shame. Let's be bold. Let's be honest. I think that's what it boils down to, being honest about where you stand with Jesus Christ and not being afraid to do that. You know, to say to your friends and neighbors, I know you think Jesus is a joke and that anyone who believes in Jesus is a fool. But for me, it's been, it's been the deciding factor in my life. It's, been, it's, been, uh, it's changed my life and the lives of others and I genuinely believe it. And it gives me hope. That shines bright in a dark world. So, Grateful for Paul for this challenge.